this out, it's my great pleasure to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, our chairman, Dr. Randy Olson. And we'll go ahead and, and maybe Dr. Olson can do some of his introductory um, comments that he didn't have a chance to give while we're working on getting his lecture up. <clears throat> so I apologize. I had an interview I had to do. It was one of those things that they said, you, you gotta you, you got to take care of at least one part in here. So uh, I missed my good friend Steve Feldman opining on what he does so well on. Steve, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, uh, I've, uh, Steve and I have worked together in AUPO for many, many years, and he continues in that role. In fact, we traded each other when we were presidents, and, uh, and a person who's an amazing administrator, and an inventor, and a great neuro-ophthalmologist, and it's just an honor to have him here. So, um, yeah, we, is it, we get it on the screen, or is it? For some reason, we're not getting it. All right, well, I, I'll just do some twisting and turning then. And let's see, and that's my advancement right there? That's correct. All right, all right, good, good. All right, so uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, first of all, let me just talk a little bit about why we have this today and what's ongoing here. As you know, this was a, a meeting that essentially, we call it Clinical Faculty Day, and we certainly have uh, good people. We have some people that are here today they are gonna do that. But my thought is, is that we have so many great researchers here. We've got so many people on the clinical side who are doing great clinical research. And what we often have lacking is communication between both sides. Um, I'll hear people say that so-and-so uh, uh, got an award and they'll say, I, I never had heard anything that they've done before. I don't know what's ongoing and what's happening. And that's a mistake. And uh, there is a general thought that oftentimes that uh, uh, things have become so specialized in area that uh, there is no ability to communicate. And I think often what's really happening is there's a dearth of interest or desire to communicate, and that therefore becomes a de facto truism that we lose the ability to understand each other. And so uh, we want to have this a fairly even mix. Uh, we want people to sit down and talk. And I do know in some cases, in some of these areas, it may be a little difficult to understand the core concept. But I think that if we all try to make sure we're speaking in the lingo that uh, is more every day and we work hard at this, I think this can become a very important event so that we can understand a bit of the breadth of what's happening here. Because I have that opportunity where I am to see and understand that and feel it and I'm so proud of all that's going on here. But you know, we miss opportunities because uh, oftentimes I'll hear about something and I'll say, well, well you know, I see Alan Crandall. Well, Alan Crandall's working in that area where so-and-so in glaucoma. Well, I didn't know that. Well, well we're not going to get the collaborations that are necessary until people do and understand. So uh, this is our first, and uh, I like to see this expand and move forward, and uh, hopefully everybody will have a, a great time. So uh, I'm going to talk about really a fairly imp simple, easy way moving forward in, in something that's actually been incredibly productive. Uh, I want to start out, first of all, as we talk about this, that I've got a lot of colleagues here that are extremely important. I've got Jeff Petty sitting up here. He's been very involved in this moving forward. Uh, frankly, uh, Jeff Petty and Bill Barlow, I'm assuming, and the plan is they're going to be taking over uh, uh, the leadership and all of this as, as we move forward. Uh, Brian uh, Zog's been very involved, Brian Stagg, had a lot of other uh, residents. Ashley is now kind of taking over the leadership as we move this on the resident side. But, but it's, it's an example of how it can be a lot of fun and it can be very straightforward. And frankly, I think it's been the most important body of knowledge that's occurred in this area, uh, certainly that I am aware of uh, during my career. So uh, cataract surgery, what's the past been of cataract surgery? It's been a bunch of talking heads talking at each other, each of them saying that this is better than that with no scientific basis whatsoever for what they're saying. And if you're in the know, like Nick is and Alan is and I am, we know who's being paid by A or B or C or D, and we can all essentially guess what their opinion is gonna be before they even say it. And that's been the state of the art of this field here for a very long period of time. So uh, what happened, is Griffin here? Griffin Jardine, did he make it? He's one of our newer faculty members. Griffin? Griffin? I'm giving you a shout out and he's not here. He's off seeing kids. 
He's at CN Kids. He's a pediatric ophthalmologist. He was a medical student, and I told him how frustrated I was. We'd been working on a project, and I said, we need something that will sit down and tell us what works and what doesn't work in regards to cataract surgery. And we talked about it a lot, and I've got to give him 100% credit, because uh, I'm a pretty good idea guy, but those of you who know me, I don't have a lot of time. And so he just wouldn't give up. And I'd say, well, let's try this, or let's try that. And he came up with what is affectionately known as the Cubinator. <laughs> and it's really, really high tech. So I'm just pointing, this doesn't have to be something. You don't need to get a million dollar piece of equipment. So what exactly is the Cubinator? Let's make sure I get, yeah, there's a pointer. So the idea is, is that we need to determine relatively equal sized chunks of cataract material, relatively equal size density of cataract material, and then by having that and looking at it, we can determine two very important facts for fragment removal. So this is the fragment removal part of it, and that is how long does it take to remove a certain size piece of material, and how often does it bounce off the tip, what we call chatter? Two very important clinical questions. Does that answer the whole issue of, and I get that in reviews all the time. No, no. But the perfect's the enemy to the good, right? You start out with something, and we'll talk about where we're moving now in regards to this. But at least for the first time, we can start debunking and objectively looking and seeing what makes sense in this field and what does not. So again, you take a nucleus, uh, and we'll start out with the uh, human cataracts with uh, Jeff Tabin. Also, a shout out to Jeff, who was able to get us a bunch of, you know, hard, uh, fresh human nuclei. You cut them into slices, then you cut them again, and then you cut them again, and you throw out the smaller ones, and you essentially get a two millimeter on a side cube. Now, are those exactly two millimeters? They're not exactly. Are they exactly the same hardness? No. But by mixing them up together and randomly selecting them, we can do 20 controlled experiments, have enough power to be able to analyze and compare. We're gonna talk about some of this work that's happened. Testing is simple. You just bring them up in your regular little testing chamber we all have, bring it to the tip. How long is it there before it's subsumed? Time it. If it bounces off, you, you stop the timer and then put it on again, and every time it bounces off, it's a chatter about. This is not, again, I mean, this is, I mean, it's amazing that, it, it no, that none of this had ever been done before, but uh, uh, this is the overall scenario moving forward. So the power of this, as you can see on these, uh, this work that was done with human nuclei, is that we can sit down now and we can do the equivalent of thousands of surgeries in a controlled fashion, something you cannot do clinically. Too many variables. There's no, there's no really, we've eliminated everything other than the variable that we're looking at and we're doing it. And this first big study that we had that came out by DeMel, uh, I think the most powerful thing that we found out that we didn't realize is how important parameters were. A lot of people always wanted to talk about what was the mode of FACO or of an ultrasound they were using. And if you look at the efficiency in regards to time, here is an example where we, we could go from 31 seconds to five seconds just based on the parameters. So if you don't know what your parameters are, I can show you anything is better than anything else. And you have to know what are optimal parameters before you compare it. So this was our first landmark study, and I think very powerful and, and opened, for us, opened our eyes as well, how critical parameters. We spent a lot of time trying to optimize those and understand it. Uh, the next step was, in as much surgery as Jeff does, he's so busy these days, he probably almost could have supplied it for us, but it's not that easy getting human uh, nuclei you know, from the third world. And so we needed to get a, uh, another model. And so uh, this particular group uh, that we put together is we, we were working on a pig model, pig lenses we can get plenty of, that were equivalent to these human lenses. So what did we do here? Same thing, here's your cubinator, putting it in place. We soaked them in balanced salt solution for 24 hours. This is the end result of lots of different experiments to find what would work. And then uh, after formal and soak, uh, different times, we'll talk about that, and then you cut it and you mix it and then you compare it. What did we find out? 
Well, the density test, it was really how much, enter, how much did it take to crush it to half of its overall size. And you can see, well, two hours looks like it's pretty close to these human nuclei that uh, uh, Jeff Tabin was bringing over from Africa. So that's looking pretty encouraging, right? So what happens when we do some clinical comparisons between those? Well, here's looking at ellipse FX, and we use the best parameters from the original study. And here's looking at, at Ozil IP, and you can see two hours. Well, I don't know why we didn't have it. We, had a, we actually have a three hour in both of these, and they were quite a bit higher. And here's the human. Wow, those are really comparable, right? So uh, looking pretty promising at this particular point. Uh, and now we now have that, uh, and, and it's essentially a two-hour soak. Uh, if you want to get harder, you can do a three-hour soak. If you want to do softer, you can do a one-hour soak. Uh, it is enough variability, and a lot of it depends upon the age of the pig nuclei, that whatever we run now, we have to run with the same batch. And that's the only difficult part about this, because when we're ready to have a big run, I know the team puts it together. Sometimes we're talking 15, 16 hours, but uh, and, and, and you want to try to get a, a shorter period of time. We've, we've actually put a lot of data and information about this. So uh, one of the questions that's been out there for a long period of time is with ultra-pulse is uh, what's the best on time and off time? I've heard people argue about this and also argue about, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, long pulses is good, now continuous is better, et cetera. We can answer those questions right now. So we're going to go fairly rapidly through some of this. So here's a, a, a paper by Kirk, came in 2014, and it's rare that it gets this clean. And it turns out that there's a very clean improvement going down to six milliseconds. Now it makes sense, the more energy you have, the more overall effect you're gonna have. But look at this. Once you get to six, it flattens out completely. You're putting more energy and you're not getting any more efficiency whatsoever. I'd love to have time to discuss why the physics of this is, because I think we understand this fairly well. But look, that tells you that you're, when you sit this, you want six milliseconds is the time that should be on. What about the off time? A lot of people have said 12, 10, you know, you know everybody has their own opinion about this. And moving forward, surprisingly clean again. I don't know what it was, but six milliseconds. And then after this, rather than uh, be flat, it actually got worse, statistically worse, so that uh, six milliseconds on, six milliseconds off, that's your sweet spot. In that uh, uh, as you continue off, you could as much as uh, double your inefficiency or your overall uh, time it takes net to remove material uh, for the same time that you have it sitting up on, up on your tip. Uh, clinically important information available for the first time. What about Kelman tip? Here's one that just shows me, I actually, uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the people here were uh, back when uh, I gave my, uh, the worst lecture, I love that, the worst lecture. When I first uh, told uh, Susan that I was asked to give the worst lecture, she said, well, you can do better than that. Uh, you know, Jan Verst uh, is the uh, IIIC, has one of their big lectures, and I talked about this. We have been taught by Charlie Kelman from time immemorial that the most way to do, efficient way to do fake emulsification was a bent tip, called the Kelman tip. Nobody has questioned that wisdom. Nobody's questioned that wisdom. So we said, okay, we've got the technology now. Is that the best way, uh, certainly at least for fragment removal, to have that angle tip? And the answer in regards to that for efficiency is no. It actually doubles the time it takes to remove a tip, and it doubles the chatter. I submit that's four times worse. But we've taken that on somebody's word with no one challenging it for 35 years. So if, if those of us involved in clinical care aren't willing to try to look at and see and question what's happening, all kinds of errors crop up and nobody knows about it. And another one I'll just talk about from uh, the worst lecture. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, uh, was a condition known as athlete's heart. Those of you who are there can't answer. So I, Liliana, is Liliana here? She can't. Nick, you can't. Who here has heard of athlete's heart? So uh, Bob Sinsky was diagnosed with athlete's heart in 1940. Athlete's heart 
was a standing pulse less than 50. It only happened to athletes, and the treatment was that you have no exercise, don't climb any stairs, no activity whatsoever, and if you do that, your pulse will come back up to where it's supposed to be. And that's what Bob Sinsky was told he had to do. Teddy Roosevelt was diagnosed with athlete's heart when he was Harvard. I love this. Uh, his uh, doctor, this is back in the 1880s, said, uh, uh, sir, if you qu don't quit all your running around and your climbing of trees, uh, it was weird for his day. He used to go out and run for an hour and a half or two hours just for the fun of it. Nobody did that back then. Nobody did that. And he had a standing pulse rate apparently like 42. He says, you'll be dead before you turn 30. And Teddy Roosevelt famously said, sir, I'd rather die than quit all my running around. Well, he was doing the right thing. What's an athlete's heart? It's the super healthy person. So what finally changed that diagnosis that went forever? It was World War II. We had all these elite troops, paratroopers, et cetera. They were diagnosing them one after another with athlete's heart when some, somebody finally said, we can't do this. We're eliminating our entire cadre of people and elite troops. Maybe it's okay. And it was really not World War II until finally this diagnosis died. I think we may have more athlete hearts out there than we realize. Tip diameter, again, big discussion going on. Uh, real short, 0 0.9 seems to be the sweet spot. We've run into some smaller size tips that do quite well with interesting design. And that's, that's then, then you're looking at other features. But as far as just a core regular round trip going on, that the combination of wanting to make sure that you totally seal to get vacuum, but you, you're, you're losing efficiency by the size of the tube, you're trying to ram it down, a 20 gauge seems to be the magic place. Uh, Micropulse, what are the best fluidic parameters associated with it? A lot of interesting work. If you look at low flow, uh, that it turns out it doesn't make any sense to go higher than 300 millimeters of mercury because you don't get anything. Look at that. Why is it? Because it turns out that if your flow is only 20 millimeters a minute, you can't generate more than 300 millimeters of mercury. You can't pull enough to generate additional vacuum above that. Well, a lot of people didn't know that. Uh, you can see that uh, it does make a difference when you start getting up at higher flow because you can f get that full vacuum realize it put in place. Again, new information, nice paper. Venturi, uh, we know a lot about Venturi. A lot of people say it's better. Is it really? What, is it, what happens with it? Uh, indeed, uh, as you can see, that at 20 milliliters per minute, it consistently is two to three times better than peristaltic as far as its overall efficiency. Uh, same time, though, is that uh, if you uh, look at 20, at, uh, uh, this is looking at uh, transverse, as far as chatter, venturi, dramatically better. Uh, you start getting up at 50 milliliters per minute, uh, it makes a difference at lower vacuums, but by the time you get to high vacuum, uh, they were statistically the same. But here's the big one. How much flow are you getting with venturi? Remember, venturi is vacuum-based. You don't control how much flow. It's inherent inside the system. Well, turns out your flow rate when your uh, vacuum base is sitting up here at 70 to 100 milliliters per minute. Now, that's a lot. That's why a lot of people have been leery about how fast things go on. So there's a price you pay. Turns out from a physical standpoint that if you were to take peristaltic flow to the same level, you should have the same overall effect between the two. So you can gauge and judge, but no question that for most of what we do, Venturi is more efficient, but there's always a price. Here's one I love. Uh, Steve Dewey made a proposition that if you round the edge of the tip and you touch the capsule, are you more likely to break it? And so uh, this, is the do, this is the regular tip. The idea is if you touch the capsule with ultrasound, you're going to break and tear it. If you round the tip and you touch it, you will not. Now that's something that he talked about for a long period of time. Wasn't good facts in association with it. So we started with some fresh human lenses. We took a look at it and wow, it looks like maybe there is something to this. Uh, turns out that you've got one shot at a fresh human lens. Once you break the capsule, you can't do it anymore. But uh, at least for the number we had, uh, this is number of taps to break. It took four versus 47. That was statistically significant. That's about a tenfold difference. So again, we said, 
we need to come up with some way that we can duplicate these results without having to go through a human lens every time. That's not that easy to do. Solution, saran wrap over a coffee can. High tech, and it works. We've got several good papers in association with that. Uh, we'll go on, this is a very busy slide, I'm not, don't get over all the details, but the key thing I wanted to show you here is if you look at it between sharp and dull, it was significantly better every step of the way. These comparisons were highly significant. Steve Dewey was right that it indeed is very protective of the capsule, often five to tenfold less likely to break it. But is there a price to pay? As a person, as an old physics major, I'm telling you that physics is a two-edged sword. You rarely get something for nothing. There's almost always a price you're gonna pay. And so, uh, again, very protective, as mentioned. We published that in American Journal of Ophthalmology. We've now recently uh, done a similar one, came out in AGO in 2015, and we showed that uh, in comparison to a linear approach, same energy, that transverse and torsional increase the capsular uh, breakage rate. I think if you touch the capsule, you move them from side to side, that's easier to shear something than going straight in and out. And uh, it was not a huge difference, but it was statistically significant. So uh, what's the price? Well, we can decide and look at that. And uh, you can see that uh, if you're looking overall, say, at an Ozel-type approach, a torsional, that, um, that we about doubled the time. So uh, when you're talking about pure torsional, yes, the Dewey tip is going to uh, cut your efficiency roughly in half, and that was statistically significant. But if you're looking at a transversal, it wasn't. Those numbers are not only not statistically different, P of 0.9, I mean, those are the same. What about micropulse ultrasound? Those are the same. Now, when we first submitted this particular article in regards to this, using a radius tip versus a non-radius tip, the questions that came back to us on this is, well, you're just looking at really, really soft nuclei here. Is this really going to hold on something that's harder? These things probably don't work on harder. And so uh, we said, fine, you know, we can make harder. We can make them as hard as you want, how long they're going to soak in formalin. So we repeated it. There you are, uh, a double the time again, significant, significant in regards to torsional, uh, transversal the same. Can you comment on the difference between transversal and torsional? So uh, for those who don't know, uh, torsional is the uh, motion that's used most in the country, and the tip wags side to side and subtends an arc. So it's a shaving motion, essentially. Transversal, the tip subsumes an ellipsoid. So there's some back and forth. A lot of it is motion. But if you look at where the tip is over a period of, say, oh, probably, you know, 100, 100 uh, milliseconds, you're, the net of that whole thing is, is there's, there's an ellipsoid. Think of a football shape overall. Whereas linear, it's very simple. It's just going straight forward and back in each of this case. Uh, and so you can see that those are exactly the same. Uh, and then, uh, it, and so uh, we repeated it completely with the hard nuclei, assuming what we had. And uh, again, I'm, I just want you to give some general concepts. Uh, we're not going to go a lot of detail. I don't have enough time because the physics of this is a little complicated. But it's important clinically to have this information. So where are we going now in regards to this? Uh, we've got new lines of inquiry that we know are important to do. Uh, we need to look at sculpting. And we've got an overall concept and ideas. Uh, we don't have it yet fully on the drawing board. The idea is a very controlled fashion where you could stick uh, a, a treated nucleus and you have a fixed pressure. And how far does it move based upon the exact parameters and the exact amount of time so that we can see what's more efficient than the other. Uh, we're very interested in seeing how femtosecond laser and what it does and compare the modalities to see which is the better pattern and which is not. And then we're also very interested in, in now looking at something which is, what does ultrasound do to the corneal endothelium? Can we measure that accurately? Can we find out what works and what does not work? So uh, there's a lot of things that we have to take for granted because we can't know everything about everything. But if we take everything for granted, we're never going to advance. We have to be prepared to question. We often assume that these are very complicated, difficult concepts. Try to get your hands around. Nothing that I talked about here is nearly as high tech as a lot of our research people are going to talk about. And yet, clinically, it's been extremely important. So just remember 
that opinions are often just that, they're opinions. And that the best thing to do is to try to figure out what the facts are, and the more fact-based we are, the more we're talking in regards to what's gonna work, whether what we think might work. And I'll also point out that clinical research like this is frankly a lot of fun. I'm like a little kid when we get a new project. Well, what did we find out? And we've had some results where I just said, I don't have a clue what that is. And it's been fun trying to figure it out. Uh, thank you very much. There's some time, I think, for a few questions. Questions for Dr. Olson? Well, just a comment. Uh, I think this is an area that's just screaming for, for research because there are so many opinions that are put out as dogma, and we really need to step back and look at it. And, and my old professor, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, had a saying in terms of politics, and he said, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. <laughs> and I think this, this really fits into this setting because there's a lot of people giving their opinions, but they're really not based on sound um, scientific method, and they're not based on a way where you're comparing apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. And so this research is so important because we really do need to look at um, the dogma that's out there and see if some of the claims that are made are truly legitimate or not. And I'm happy to see that, that some of the younger faculty and some of the residents are continuing to do this important research because as a journal editor, I'm having a heck of a time when I get papers that state something from one group because you can't even get unbiased reviewers. So it's either they're in company A or other company A. And so you have difficulty trying to get unbiased opinions but unbiased reviews, but just unbiased mm -hmm literature in general, and that's why I think these studies are so important. Thank you. Um, a comment and a question. Griffin did walk in, so I just want to make sure you... Griffin! <laughs> Where are you, Griffin? <laughs> Griffin Jardine. Let's all give him a hand. I gave you credit for starting this whole line. As a medical student, he persevered to figure out and bring the Cubinator to life, and that's been a host of different paper ever since then. Griffin, great to see you and have you here. Well, thank you, Dr. Olson. Mm -hmm.